All right, welcome to the Raptors Weekly Extra podcast for Friday, January the 8th. I'm your host, Blake Murphy. I am here with the modern day William Liu. William Liu. Will, how's it going, buddy? I'm very modern. Would you say you're the modern day Asian Canadian Zaza Pachulia? Uh, definitely. In head size, for sure. For sure. Uh, Zaza Pachulia got clowned for his, uh, understandably clowned really, for his extremely large head by Dirk Nowitzki. And they're forming a very unlikely but also very adorable bromance. Also, Zaza's awesome. Like in basketball terms, he's very good. Yeah, it's it's weird for a guy to break out when he's like 32, but he might be actually be older than 32, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, he's having a great season. Who who saw that coming? I don't know. It's uh, he's a nice guy for uh for Jonas Valanciunas to watch because Pachulia does a lot of non box score things very well that a big guy like Valanciunas were the basketball IQ to develop would be you know within the realm of possibility for a guy his size and with his particular skill set. Another guy, uh, it makes sense for Jonas Valanciunas to watch closely. Brooke Lopez, the guy he outplayed on Wednesday night. What do you think? I, I, we won't do the whole game breakdown because that's your your and Gerard's stick for Mondays. But uh, just quickly, thoughts on Valanciunas's performance on Wednesday? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was his best game of the season. Well, not maybe not the best game of the season, but best performance uh, post injury for sure. He finished with 22 points, 11 rebounds, eight of 13 shooting, two blocks. Um, yeah, he was just, it, it's one of those rare occurrences where JV is like quicker and more athletic than the guy he's guarding or the guy guarding him, which in this case was Brooke Lopez. And I thought JV did a lot of smart things to sort of play in control and, and on offense, like picking his spots. So you don't usually see JV crash the boards for someone else's rebound and succeed and get the putback, but he did a lot of that. Uh, it, it also helps that Brook Lopez is a statue, so if you uh, like get rid of the guard and pick and roll and make him guard both the ball handler and JV, typically speaking, JV is going to be able to get open on that and dunk it pretty easily. And uh, Corey Joseph and Kyle Lowry, you know, were pretty good at finding him in the pick and roll. But there are also some other things, man. JV had a soft little turnaround ten footer, um, sort of turnover the shoulder kind of counter move in the post for his first score. So look, it's very encouraging and like. Well, I don't necessarily think that it can be translated to all perf- all games because it's a bit of a matchup thing because um, Lopez is much slower than JV, um, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so JV is able to use the speed. But at the same time, it's also really positive because if you recall last year, Brooke Lopez destroyed JV. There was a couple of games where Brooke Lopez had over 30. I thought Lopez did a did a good job, or sorry, Valanciunas did a good job defensively. Uh, I think it's pretty telling that Lopez did almost all of his damage when Valanciunas was on the bench. So JB, when he was guarding Lopez, Lopez shot 7 of 15 and had 7 rebounds. That's in 27 minutes. 13 minutes, JB was on the bench. Lopez went 4 of 6 and grabbed 6 rebounds and had all 3 of his blocks, which I think speaks to what you were saying earlier about how the Nets... You know, they were kind of handcuffed defensively because Valanciunas can do so much damage. So, you know, Lopez isn't an elite defender, but he's pretty solid and he's a decent help rim protector. And he wasn't able to do those things because he had to stay tethered to Valanciunas. So not only did that, you know, not only was Valanciunas playing well himself, but him playing well and the effect that that had on the defense opened things up. I mean, the plus minus within a single game doesn't always tell you much, but... Raptors were plus 22 in Valanciunas' 27 minutes against Lopez. So, like, I mean, they, he decisively won that matchup. Lopez got his box score stats, but he did so, you know, it took him a lot of shots to get there. He did most of his damage with Valanciunas on the bench. Yeah, and it's it's not that surprising, too, that uh, Lopez, who's obviously one of the league's best post players, would have success against Biombo because I feel like, generally speaking, Biombo's best skill defensively is um, being the help defender in the pick and roll whatever and coming over rotating and blocking and challenging shots that way whereas if like a guy like Lopez has his back to him and stuff his Biombo's like leaping ability um and athleticism is really mitigated and it's more about his core strength and the way Biombo's built it's just that he he's a bit like relatively obviously for a seven footer like a bit thin for in the in the midsection um so I I, I found just just watching this year that Biombo's kind of struggled a little bit with checking post defenders. So obviously def- Biombo's a great defender overall, but it, it comes to matchups a little bit. And I think that against the bigger dudes, JV's actually a better option, I think, to guard post-up guys because he's just straight up stronger. And while he's less athletic, um, 
you know, a post defense, a lot of it is just being able to hold your ground and having a lot of length. And I think JV does a, a better job. And I think that that, you know, bore itself out uh, in uh, Tuesday's game or Wednesday's game. Yes, Wednesday's game. Who knows what day it is ever in the yeah. uh, the lines of work that we live in. But yeah, I agree with most of that. Biombo, you know, he's so good at protecting the rim and help and, and covering in the pick and roll and stuff like that. It's He's a very good defensive player, but it's not disparaging to say that there are certain matchups that he's not well suited for. This was uh, this was one of them. If I'm remembering correctly, he didn't have a very good game against DeMarcus Cousins either, which, you know, Cousins isn't strictly a back-to-the-basket guy. He can do a lot of face-up stuff too, but, you know, that's too pretty big matchups like that that Biombo has struggled in. Overall, the defense was great. You know, the Nets are a flaming tire fire, but 74 points allowed on 93 possessions is a great defensive outing no matter who you're against. Uh, and that game was, you know, kind of necessary. The Raptors needed that. Damari Carroll, the big news on Wednesday was that he underwent arthroscopic surgery on his right knee, which reports have him from Bruce Arthur and Michael Grange out in the six to eight week range, which would bring him back after the All-Star break, but still in time uh, to get, you know, eight or 10 games under his belt ahead of the playoffs, which is to me all that really matters. Will, how concerned are you with the the latest Carroll setback? And, you know, what are your thoughts on how the Raptors will survive and if this matters at all? Well, I mean, it definitely matters. It, it definitely matters. It, it it Basically, I mean, we haven't necessarily noticed too much of Carroll's impact because he's kind of been in and out of the lineup, and now he's out of the lineup again. And the Raptors did um, do pretty well with him out of the lineup, but it's um, it does throw everything in, out of whack because, first of all, you're getting DeRozan to play more minutes at small forward, and you're getting DeRozan probably to play more minutes overall. And part of the goal was in adding someone like Carroll was that it could hopefully take some of the, you know, workload off the main guys in DeRozan and Lowry. And I guess Lowry's a little bit less impacted, but just losing a key cog in terms of uh, the best wing defender and a, and a great, well, not great spot up shooter, but a pretty good spot up shooter. It, it does hurt because now you're sort of stuck with um, playing the two components of uh, Carroll's game. So if you want defense, you're going to have to put James Johnson in there. If you want more three-point shooting, you have to put uh, you know TJ Ross in there. You can't have both on the floor, which is kind of what you can do with Carroll. And you, you lose some flexibility as well because he, you know, he was part of that uh, closing lineup when he played the four. Uh, it just, it, I don't know, man. It, ju- it just sucks. But at the same time, I just hope that since it was kind of a lingering um knee injury and he had you know the foot problem it's it, it I, I just really hope that he takes the, the next two months um fully recovers and comes back to the playoffs because i think the raptors are fine in terms of trying to make the playoffs i think in the for the rest of the regular season it's probably like you're, you're probably losing like between one and two wins um with uh you know him being out for the next two months but at the same time i think that's still enough for the raptors to make the playoffs and as long as carl's healthy for the playoffs like it's weird to say that about a 50 million a year player but ultimately he was brought here for playoff style basketball and he needs to be healthy for that that's where i'm at with it too it's uh you can't measure damari carroll's contract you can't measure damari carroll's impact you can't measure anything with these raptors really until the playoffs, and I've kind of been, you know, probably to the point of being annoying at this point about how the regular season really doesn't matter that much to me. It's important for this team finding chemistry and this team finding what works and what doesn't and who's going to play and who isn't. And it's interesting in terms of find, like learning exactly what this team is. But in terms of measuring the team, there's... You know, there's little we're going to learn. We know they're a 45 to 50 win team. We know they're roughly a home court advantage team in the East. We know that their playoff fate is probably going to come down to matchups. Carroll's setback sucks. It sucks from a chemistry building standpoint since the starting five really hadn't found footing together yet. It sucks from just maybe even a Carroll uh, confidence standpoint. But in terms of where this team could be in April and how we're going to evaluate them after the season's over, it doesn't really change a lot for me. What's crazy to me about the Demar Carroll injury is that I didn't I didn't realize this. 100% of Raptors Republic Twitter followers and commenters are certified doctors who have been through medical school and are surgeons, uh, arthroscopic knee surgeons in specific. It, it's crazy just how much knowledge and how easy it was for everyone 
to diagnose exactly what was wrong with Carroll, exactly the missteps the Raptors organization had taken, and exactly his timeline for recovery, all from the two words arthroscopic surgery, which is the only information that the team released. It's astonishing to me that there are so many people out there with that level of skill just reading Raptors Republic. Look, we have an educated cast of writers, and that naturally draws um, a more educated uh, <laughs> group of readers. No, I'm kidding. Look, I'm I'm being an asshole here, but it really it really bothers me. We don't we don't know. The words that we have to go off of are arthroscopic surgery, which can mean anything from you know Meta World Peace had arthroscopic surgery and was back in two weeks. Arthroscopic surgery also covers things like microfracture surgery. Microfracture surgery is a technically a form of arthroscopic surgery. So your timeline, based on the only information that the franchise gave, is two weeks to two years. Other saying anything more specific than that, or you know, trying to say, well, this happened to me, or this happened to this other player, we don't know. Arthroscopic surgery can mean a ton of different things. Right. This backwards diagnosis too, that oh, you knew this happened, or the injury was hidden before, or the the injury was known about before he signed the deal. When, as a reminder, Demar Carroll suffered this injury, banging knees with DeAndre Jordan in the Clippers game in late November, chasing JJ Redick around the screen, um, mm. not related to the plantar fasciitis, which. Whether or not you thought he should have got more rest for that, it, it's he banged knees with DeAndre Jordan, and it's been the management since then. I also have a real problem with this whole the team was neglectful. Um, you know, the organization was up to something shady here. Do people do people honestly think that the Raptors don't want what's best for the Raptors? Like it, the idea that they forced Carroll to play on this injury, or that they were neglectful, or you know, loosey goosey with how they handled it is. Like, the Raptors have more incentive than anyone for the Raptors to do well, and it's two months into a four-year contract that's a heavy investment. I don't I don't understand where people get this idea that the Raptors would do anything but what's in the Raptors' best interest. And, and the Raptors organization is not short-sighted enough to think that these wins in December and January matter more than what's going to happen in the playoffs, especially after what happened the last two years. So for everyone to sit there and go off of no information and diagnose Carroll and, and make... And also, you know, suggests that the organization, you know, has acted improperly when up until this year, the medical staff and Alex McKechnie, head of sports science, have had a pristine reputation. One it, of the best. I'm, I'm pulling my hair out about it for for two days now because everyone mm -hmm. thinks they know best and everyone is going off of absolutely no information, which like I get it. Everyone's frustrated. A, a key player and a key offseason addition is out six to eight weeks. We don't know. That's the honest answer. It's it's annoying. It's frustrating. You know, you can be frustrated and you can be bothered by the injury. It does suck, but we don't know anything about it. So, like, it kills me that people can, like, angrily and aggressively and earnestly suggest that they think the organization was neglectful and, like, is not doing what's best for the organization. It's it's similar. I, I know you have some thoughts on uh, the Tim and Sid comments from the other night about DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry. You know, they, they're playing well, but do they want to win? Of course they want to win. Of course the organization wants what's best for the organization. Of course these players want to win. Where are people getting this that the Raptors want anything other than what's best for the Raptors? Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get to those asinine comments a bit later. But, uh, yeah, look. It boils down to this, and I think if you're rationally thinking about it, the Raptors have the most information, and their medical staff are the best trained to make decisions based on that information. So there's like almost no perspective in which a fan or even a very knowledgeable fan with personal or actual academic background and such a thing to sort of make sweeping comments about how the Raptors handled it because they A, they have more information and B, they have better decision makers to process that information. But at the same time, I think the frustration and the discourse, obviously it's 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 irrational and a lot of fandom is irrational. It sort of just, it speaks to the human tendency to look for patterns and look for explanations for everything that happens. And it's attribution error. It is. If I make a mistake, there was, you know, there could be any number of external factors acting on me. If you make a mistake, it was you that made the mistake. Like that's that's yeah. what we fail to realize is that, you know, the Raptors could have taken every set. And this is how I see it. I don't have any extra information on what's public. This is how I read what played out. Carroll hurt the knee against the Clippers. He tried to play through 
the pain because he's a tough guy who always tries to play through the pain. And after yeah, but like, hold on, hold on. That, that, this idea that Carroll might not be tough, this is insane. Carroll's he literally did, did played. Did you guys the, not see the, the MCL injury that he sustained while trying to guard LeBron James in last year's playoffs, and then return the next game? Like, yeah, LeBron like tried to help carry him off the floor. Like that's how bad that injury was. And like, so this is this is how I am reading what happened. He got hurt in the Clippers game. He tried to play through it because he's a tough guy. Once it became noticeable, something was up. You know, they the team got it looked at, and then at that point. I would think that they looked at it and were like, okay, you know, may, your options are A, undergo the arthroscopic surgery now to figure out what's going on in there, or B, give it a couple weeks of rest, see if that fixes it, and then you're going to have to undergo arthroscopic surgery if it doesn't. And he opted to rest and try to play through it because he's a tough guy and he wants to be on the floor. I think that's probably a pretty common approach to injuries when there's no like apparent structural damage that gets revealed in a, in an MRI or an examination or whatever it is, you know, you try to rest first if surgery is not, you know, if surgery is not necessarily going to be required. And ideally, now that we know that it didn't heal with rest, ideally, sure, three, four weeks ago, he got the surgery done. So he's back later. But had he, you know, maybe rest fix it, maybe it was just a contusion and it just needed a couple weeks of rest. That's a, if that's what happened, I don't think that's a neglectful or careless gamble. I think that's, you know, a player who wanted to be out there and didn't want to miss eight weeks if he only had to miss two. And without going in there, there was no way to really know. So if that's the case, then, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. Ideally, this wouldn't happen. But that's, you know, that's, hindsight 2020 like you can't analyze a situation based on what happened after the fact you can only analyze on the information you had at the time right the story while the ball's in the air yes Dan Van Gundy yes three-point shooting the, the quality of a three-point shot is not determined by whether or not it goes in it's a sucky situation um and it, it really it really is disappointing because he was the um premier addition in the offseason and he hasn't necessarily gotten a full chance because of injuries to fully show his impact to the team. But I mean, for it just it just sucks. But at the same time, the goal right now is just to get healthy. And like, if we just recalibrate to the start of the year, I think everyone knew this. But the Raptors obviously had a huge flaw in terms of on defense and specifically guarding bigger wings, and that's why Carroll was brought in. That and other reasons. He's a good player aside from just defense, but. Um, hopefully he comes back fully healthy. He's able to find his footing with the last month of the season. Um, and then, yeah, and then it just, it just comes down to, can he perform in the playoffs? And that's weird to say again, for the premier addition in the off season, because you've already seen guys like weirdly enough, Bismack Biombo and Corey Joseph, who are, I would even Louis Scola, who are the three other big additions, if you can even call those guys big. And they've had, um, a, a bigger just volume of impact on the team, but, you know, like Carol's Carol's a really good player, and uh, hopefully he comes back and uh, fully healthy, and he he can find the chemistry and then show up for the playoffs. Because again, we've we've seen moments of what he can do. We've we've seen him guard LeBron James. We saw him shut down Paul George. Um, like th this is the guy we need. This is the guy we need, and we now now we need him to be healthy. Yep, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's probably all we need to talk about. Uh, Do you think we need to make a trade to, in the interim to kind of replace kind of what he has? or? Will, given how well you know me, yeah. do you think my answer to that question is yes, we should make a panic trade? All right. <laughs> I, I specifically wanted to, make, to ask you if you wanted to make a panic trade for P.J. Tucker, who I... I'm slightly intrigued, but I don't know why I'm so intrigued by these like terrible wing players on terrible teams. He's not. He's not terrible. He can knock down a three, and he can defend he's, two, maybe he three. Kind of can knock down a three. Like he's like Demar Derozan in the corner can knock down a three. Not uh, Demar Carroll. He can spot up, hit a three. He's not a big threat, but he can guard twos and threes and probably even fours. You know, he's the one that got away as a former Raptor second round pick. He'd be an interesting target. I don't. Uh, what's he got left? One year after this year. Yeah, I think it's like five million. So again, like matching salaries is hard again. Yeah, exactly. So anything, anything in the like three to five million range for another player's salary is going to be tough to match because you're either giving up James Johnson. Uh, I'm assuming Luis Skull is not going anywhere. You're either giving up James Johnson, which then takes another guy out of the uh, out of the rotation, 
or you know you're piecing together multiple prospects which you know I, it's hard to figure what kind of team would be interested in you know a delon wright anthony bennett package right um the Raptors, I've talked about this a lot, I've written about it a lot, and maybe I've been too negative on it, but it's hard to envision the Raptors making very many types of deals. It's basically a player and a pick for an upgrade on that player. It's not a case where they can really trade a couple prospects or just take back salary. Their salary structure just doesn't make sense that way. There are a few guys out there, I think PJ Tucker's an okay target. Uh, if the Kings fall out of it, I'd love to kick the tires on Omri Caspi, even though he doesn't really fill the defensive void that Damari Carroll's left. Um, in the same vein, Bogdanovich from the Nets. You Ooh, know, I when, love Bogdanovich. When, when Carroll's back, Bogdanovich is on paper a decent uh, bench wing for this Raptors team. There are a few guys like that. There is nobody out there I see... There, there aren't 3 and D guys on the market yeah. right now. The issue is that so few teams are out of it here in early January that most teams aren't really going to have a choice to, but to wait until February uh, just because like there are no sellers yet, which means those teams that are selling can ask for a ridiculous amount. Yeah, but eventually like that, that will happen. I think they will start. Teams will fall out of it and realize, oh my God, there's a lot of benefit because the price is so high for us to start selling. And I think uh, at that point, I mean, it, it, like you said, it'll only come in at least a month from now. So yes. um, right now there are only three teams in the East and one team in the West that you would say, okay, they're definitely selling. Yeah, exactly. And, and um, even then, like the one of the teams in the East is Milwaukee. Who it's who are you going to pluck from that team? That's not, that you know their only intriguing players are young pieces. They're not going to move. Brooklyn doesn't really have anyone. The Sixers whatever the lakers don't really have anyone it's tough I, I hate to be negative about it because trade speculation is one of the most fun things about being a fan and about being a blogger but they're just the, the raptor salary structure is just so weird um the bigger concern than you know getting damari carroll back or uh, filling the void with a trade is that will this team's best players do they care to win right that's a that's a huge problem it's a, it's a huge problem for a lot of athletes who um are not competitive somehow make it to the league's the, the world's highest levels without that level of competition and then all of a sudden it becomes an Achilles heel because you know you got to have the heart of a champion and if you look at the Raptors roster there's not a lot of uh champions on that roster uh, it's just Corey Joseph who definitely has the heart of the champion and is Canadian so he's a good guy okay um, let's stop with the facetiousness and let's actually address this um <laughs> Tim and Sid the other day uh, joined the Blake Murphy club of getting called out by DeMar DeRozan on Twitter. Nice. Um, Great club. Basically, uh, Tim and Sid, I forget, it was Tim saying it, right? It was basically... Uh, you they, know, both DeRozan, have, they both had asinine comments, I would say. DeRozan and Lowry are playing really well, but they have to decide, do they want to be winners? Which, who, who the hell knows what that means anyway? But mm -hmm. also, like, the suggestion that these players, this is their entire life... In DeRozan's case, he's about to hit free agency where, you know, team success is a huge chip in making you an attractive piece. Like, obviously, these guys want to win. What What is the, like, what, uh, you got even more frustrated by these comments than I did, I think. And I, I can't even put into words how stupid I thought it was. Like, Tim, he qualified it by saying they're both all-star caliber players and they need to figure out if they want to be winners. I, I don't even necessarily know what they mean like you're not a loser because you just don't you don't make the finals or whatever like I, I feel like their abilities have been fairly maximized there's no question of effort when it comes to Lowry or DeRozan look look at how much weight Lowry's lost in the offseason he, he shed like 20 plus pounds you know as a guy who weighed like 200 pounds or 210 pounds and that's that's really hard to do um and obviously he's come back in the best shape of his life he's playing the best of his career, DeRozan's playing the best of his career. Like, I don't understand why this is the time to, to, to slap some of these guys around. And, you know, like obviously Larry and DeRozan agreed with that. Larry hit, hit them with the, uh, do the research before you speak. And, uh, DeRozan hit them with the SMH. <laughs> um, so, and, and yeah, look, and like some of the other stuff, like calling DeRozan the modern day Rudy Gay, like what does that even mean? Rudy Gay it doesn't still, mean anything. Rudy Gay is the modern day Rudy Gay. Yeah, Rudy Gay is like 29. He's still around. Like, um, yeah. I mean, like, look, can there's a way to critique a, a player's performance, especially um, 
if it's like a structural thing. And I think we, I, I'm not, not to claim superior superiority or anything, but like there are a lot of outlets like Raptors Republic where we will make observations based on sort of evidence. We look over the film and try to support that evidence. It's, it's on the role of the journalist to create an argument uh, and based on observation and then back that up. Right. And, you know, with like a breaking a down post, if there's someone who's struggling and consistently making the same mistakes, you can write about that and you can try to diagnose that problem and you can try to offer, um, cl lend clarity into the problem and then lend, uh, put a solution to that problem if there is one, right? But it, it's on the role of the journalist to present evidence for this stuff. And it's not just like reading into their minds by watching them either in the arena or at home through a television, like you know, questioning their will to win is like a very, very lazy argument as compared to something like, like a constructive critique or, and something that's substantial is like DeRozan, like he shoots a lot of mid-range shots. Is that necessarily good for the Raptors and how effective is that? And you can sort of back that up. But like saying that he's like the modern and Rudy Gay is just, what does that, what does that even mean? If you're going to take a crap on the, the Raptors two best players, like you got to come with something better than are you winners and what's a modern and Rudy Gay? Like, uh, I don't. I don't even want to talk about it anymore. But the, the worst part is they would be moving goalposts anyway. Lowry could. Lowry and DeRozan could fundamentally change their games and you know do whatever it is Tim and Sid think they need to do to sacrifice to help the team win more. And then the Raptors could make the Eastern Conference Finals. And then this time next year, DeRozan and Lowry wouldn't be doing enough to be winners because this isn't a championship team or something like that. The goalposts would just move. And that's the benefit of having an argument that's not based in fact or reality or anything even tangible is that you could just frame it however you want and, and move the goalposts around and no one can ever, you know, prove you wrong because there's no evidence for or against what you're trying to say, which, ah, ah, ah. Okay. Yeah, look, it's, 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 it's a silly thing. It's a silly thing, man. What is with news breaking while we're doing this podcast, by the way? But anyway, this is a major, major world of wrestling news, so I won't talk about it on here. Oh my god, I thought you were going to talk about All-Star voting. Which no, All-Star voting, who cares? Whatever, second round came in, Lowry's third, DeRozan's sixth, you probably already know that by the time you hear this podcast. And yeah, man, Kobe Bryant has, by the way, two times, as, twice as many votes as LeBron James, which is kind of nuts. I'm I'm having trouble getting, I maybe we started this whole NBA vote thing too early, um, I'm having trouble getting too worked up about it now. Uh, it also doesn't help matters that, you know, Jimmy Butler has been really good. John Wall's been really good. Kyrie Irving hasn't played enough to quote unquote deserve an all-star berth, but, but he also is really he's awesome. Yep. And great for the all-star game. Like no offense to Larry. I think Larry's um, at their best right now. I think Larry's slightly, well, not slightly. I think Larry's better than, than Irving, but at the same time, like, do I want to see Kyrie Irving cross up, like, Dirk Nowitzki and, you know, make a spinning layup? Or do I want to see Kyle Lowry take a pull-up three and then take a charge? Like, you know, qualitatively. and for Sorry, not qualitatively. Like just for entertainment-wise, I'd rather see Irving, too. But at the same time, I think Lowry will obviously make it as a reserve at the very least. But at the same time, hey, you know, we the North, man. If we really want to be out here, we should be out there voting. Um... Justin Bieber, Drake, where you at? Probably the last second push. So, yeah, man. Uh, Corian wanted us to just talk about sadness. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, are we are. We, we have. Are we have not. We are not Sportsfeld guys. We are not Sportsfeld. Although we are admirers of Sportsfeld. Um, yeah. If you want to hear more sadness, I mean, just listen to the, the defeated with me and Arun, uh, which comes out uh, very infrequently. But there's there more go. sadness on that one. It's literally called the defeated. All right. Um, anything else you want to talk about before we get off? We we had said at the start that we would always keep this to half an hour, and we've now come in multiple weeks in a row without even a plan and just riffed for half an hour. So mm -hmm. maybe we don't need a game plan at all. Hey, man, maybe we're like the Raptors. You know, we just have a couple flowy sets, and then, you know, you and I, the Rose and Larry, you know, we, we yeah. make it happen. Run a little floppy action, a little loop four. Oh, of course, it's... of course. Oh, by the way, actually, I have this uh, a weird little theory on the Raptors' offense is that like if the if the opposing team, maybe this is a silly thing because like it's not realistic at all. But if the opposing team didn't try as hard to stop the Raptors at doing their their flow stuff before the Raptors actually get to the shooting part, I think a lot of the Raptors' offense is generated in that motion. Like for example, on that like three that that weave that they do with the three 
players on the perimeter and usually results in a Lowry driver shot. The double she, dribble handoff to get the switches? Yeah. Like, if you just switch liberally and, like, didn't try to fight so hard over the screens and stuff and just let the Raptors shoot, I just generally, if you if you just let the Raptors shoot, I think it's um the the bulk of the Raptors offense or the, the, what makes the Raptors offense truly, really good, and it is really good, it's, like, fifth in the league, um, is the free throw shooting. So if you just didn't try as hard to, like, stop the flow motion stuff before that stuff and just rotate and sort of sag back and protect the paint, I don't think the Raptors actually have enough shooting to hurt a team. I think that's uh, something you would explore in the playoffs when you can advance scout mm-hmm. and you can game plan for a specific team for multiple games in a row. I don't think it's realistic for teams to break their defensive principles by too much for that's single true. games over the course of an 82-game year. I think you're better off you know, making small tweaks to your defensive game plan for an opponent. Um, come playoff time, though, you know, let yeah, it's, Lowry... It's a worry. Yeah, try to... You know, Kyle Lowry, Corey Joseph, beat us on beat us on threes high over those screens. We'll, or drives we'll to the them. basket when we have a center there waiting for you because we know that you, if the if the three point shot isn't falling for Lowry, he m- likes to get a lot of his points on those drives, and the rest of them are basically just like scrap stuff. Where he obviously is such a smart player, it's not to be discounted to call it scrap stuff, but it's like miscellaneous type plays where he'll get a steal, go to the basket, or he will. Um, uh, you know, pick up, find the outlet, or he'll get an outlet pass off a kick out off an offensive rebound and hit that three. But in terms of actual qualitative stuff that the Raptors do or that Lowry can do, it's not actually as much as his offensive numbers would suggest, which is a bit weird to say. Which is not to say he's not a good player. Like, all the stuff matters. All the plays matter. Hashtag all plays matter. Is that what I used the other day? All plays matter or all shots matter? I don't know, man. Everything matters. Yeah. And at the same time, because everything matters, it means nothing matters in relative terms. There you go. There's your there's your talk on sadness, Eric Kareen. Okay, let's uh let's wrap it up there. We'll talk uh we'll talk again next week, maybe with a game plan, maybe not. We'll see we'll see how the week goes. Next week, uh Raptors are in England, so I don't know. I don't know what we'll do with that. Are you gonna cover that? Are you gonna go to England or Oh yeah, I'm off to England. I'm in Santa Cruz right now for the D League showcase, off to England. Beautiful stuff. Yeah, I'm not doing any of that. Um, oh yeah, sitting. by the way, you want you want to speak a bit on your boy Ronald Roberts, who could very well be off the team by the time the podcast, well, not off the team, but off the 905 by the next time this podcast comes out. Yeah, I mean, there's not much to say. I wrote a big feature on him for a really good feature. By the way, everyone go read Blake's feature. Basically, yeah, Roberts has shown now over parts of two D League seasons that he's too advanced for the D League. His skills, which are elite rebounding and cleaning up around the bucket for easy points should translate to just about the bench of just about any NBA team. Um, it's kind of cut week for the NBA as as of 5 p.m. Thursday. Non-guaranteed and partially guaranteed contracts have to be waived in order to clear the books in time. So some roster spots are going to open up. I would be surprised and disappointed if Roberts uh, came back with the 905 from the D-League Showcase in Santa Cruz. I think he's the number one big man in the D-League right now if you were to list out most likely call-ups. If you are struggling a team like the Phoenix Suns, who, by the way, just cut two guys yesterday, I think Bryce For Cotton, this exact reason, yeah. Exactly. Go pick up someone like Roberts, man. Like, at the very least, you had, like, a 6'10 guy with a 40-inch vertical. Just do some fun stuff in garbage time. Um, and give, give a, a guy stretch, a real but... shot. Okay, yeah, that's true. He's a bit undersized just height-wise. But, I mean, obviously, the athleticism makes up for a lot of that. and just We all need to stop talking about height as a... As that's a true. measure, anyway, for the most part, I'm I'm gonna write something at some point about how we we've, we've got to find a way to measure functional size as some function of uh, standing reach and uh, wingspan because height really only matters in terms of you know if you're a ball handler seeing over defenders and then if you're a defender you know people seeing around you it doesn't your height doesn't really dictate much other than that it's a simple proxy for other measurements that we know like wingspan and standing reach. Yeah, like Draymond Green isn't necessarily six seven functionally. He's obviously not six seven functionally. He's the wingspan functionally, and actually being six seven helps him a lot because now he's able to move faster and he's able to keep a lower center of gravity, and he's able to chuck Hayes his way a lot in the post defensively. Yeah. And you know, you compare two guys like say Rudy Gobert and Simbular, who measure similarly in height, and Rudy Gobert has a functional height of like thirteen feet, and Simbular has a functional height of exactly what his height is. Whoa, so, whoa, he's got like two inches on that vertical at least. Yeah. He's traveling with the team soon, right? 
he's traveling with the team for the D-League Showcase. It's the first okay. time he'll travel this year. Let's wrap it up there. Thanks very much for listening. Will, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me, buddy. As always, buddy. We'll see you guys next week from England. Not from our, England. Not from England. <laughs> from our computers. Uh, all right. See you guys.